Photographic images of the universe around us are now commonplace. But long before the first space probes had even travelled above the Earth's atmosphere, a group of people were creating images of places which no human being had ever seen. For over 40 years, space artist David Hardy's imagination has taken him to the other worlds of our solar system and beyond as he creates illustrations for books, magazines and television. So how did this fascination for space begin? I've always been interested in space really, right back to when I was a boy, when some of my friends wanted to be uh, cricketers or footballers or back in those days train drivers. Um, I was always fascinated by pictures of the moon and Saturn's rings in, in encyclopedias, things of that sort. Went down to the local library and got all the books I could on the subject and by the time I was about uh, 12 or 14 I was starting to paint what I thought some of those worlds might look like if, if you actually stood on them. During the 40s and 50s, British artist R. A. Smith was creating black and white images of expeditions into orbit and on to the moon. But for the young David Hardy, there was one undisputed master. The person really who influenced me most was, uh, or initially, was Chesley Bonnestell. In 1950, at the local library, I found a book called The Conquest of Space, which was by Willy Ley, um, a rocket scientist, and obviously from Germany originally. And uh, Chesley Barnstall had produced these absolutely amazing photographic illustrations. They were of oil paintings. I took it to show my art teacher, Mr. Welburn, and said, how do you think he's done these? He said, well, they're photographs, aren't they? He's, He's taken photographs of mountains and things and he's superimposed a black sky with planets or something like that. I said, well, no, it says here they're oil paintings. And he had a look and, well, if you want to do that, he said, you've just got to work at it. And um, I, I guess I did, really. <laughs> the next really important stage was when I met Patrick Moore when I was uh, 18. And uh, he asked me to illustrate a book, which I did in, that was in 1954. And for many years, I became Patrick Moore's uh, sort of chief in fact, only illustrator on the sky at night in 1957, and most of his books. I've been freelance since 1965, before which I worked at Cadbury's um, doing literally chocolate boxes. And 1974, I started writing my own books, writing and illustrating my own books. In 1989, um, I wrote and a book was published called Visions of Space, which traces the, uh, the history of space art. Obviously, I knew a fair amount about it, but I had to do quite a lot of research for that book as well. It really dates back to about 1897, when the first space art appeared. There was an artist called Lucien Rudeau, a French astronomer, who produced the first sort of accurate uh, paintings of the moon, because he was an observer of the moon. Chesley Bonnestell illustrated a series of articles for Life magazine of uh, Saturn from its various moons and he included little tiny figures of astronauts standing on rocks and so forth which the, the editors said were put in for scale. Well, I remember Arthur C. Clarke was particularly outraged at that because he said of course they're not just for scale, people are going to go there one day. In the 1950s they produced a series of articles in Colliers by Werner von Braun showing spaceships with great wings um, going into space into orbit around the Earth, building huge space stations, then, and then assembling moon ships in orbit, which would then go onto the moon, taking 12 men each to the moon. There's no doubt in my mind that um, this, this series was extremely influential in um, interesting the, the American public, at any rate, in the, the idea of space travel and making them believe that it really could be done. And uh, later on, of course, President Kennedy undoubtedly picked up on this and uh, announced that men, men were going to go to the moon by, the, uh, by, by 1970. Nowadays, one of Stoll's pictures are seen as very dated because, again, he, knowing that the moon had no atmosphere, no air, no water, he assumed that the mountains were going to be very dramatic and jagged, and that's the way he painted them. And in some ways, it's, it's pity, I think, because it gave people a false impression of what we'd find when we got to the moon, and they were probably rather disappointed with the rather flat rolling landscapes that uh, Apollo found, especially the first few missions, of course, where they just landed on a flat plane for safety and there was very little there to see at all. 
in order to do space art, then you really have to have a fair knowledge of um, of the subjects. We have to, you have to have a fair knowledge of physics and chemistry and obviously astronomy and it helps if you've actually done some observing yourself rather than just looking at photographs or looking at Hubble pictures. Gradually over the years the space probes have brought in more and more information and I was actually in, in Pasadena in 1989 when the Voyager pictures came in from Neptune and Triton and uh, we actually saw that there were geysers on Triton, these, these dark marks which were obviously produced by uh, gases erupting from the surface and, and falling back and that sort of thing is absolutely amazing. I mean to, to think that out there right on the edge of the solar system, these sort, of, these sort of processes are going on which nobody had guessed at. And so over the years, huge amounts of information have come in and, and the artists digest it all and uh, it's all grist for the mill and it, it, it appears in, in their paintings. With any painting, the initial impact is obviously important and therefore the artistic input is, is, is extremely important. But as a space artist, the accuracy is also paramount and um, it depends on the view of the the, um, the astronomer obviously is going to look at a painting and say, well, that can't be right. He's, he's shown Saturn there with the rings wide open from, from Dione and all the, all the moons are in the same plane as the rings, therefore they should be a, a straight line. Well, well no, no space artist worth his salt obviously would make that mistake. When I was at school, I used to use watercolours out of a little box and, and they, the pictures always turned out wishy-washy and I wasn't happy with them. And uh, my art teacher suggested I should try pen and ink, and I started using strong blacks and whites with, with pen and ink. And I moved on to scraperboard. In fact, the first book I ever illustrated for Patrick Moore, Sons, Myths and Men in 1954, was done in, on, on scraperboard, which has a black surface, and you scratch it and, and you get it produced white, and therefore, of course, it's ideal for space because you've got the black space, and then you scrape away the highlights of the mountains or the planets or whatever tissue drawing. Um, but, uh, Gradually I developed uh, techniques using gouache, which is a kind of watercolour, but it's, it's used much more thickly. Since 1985, I've been using computers. I've, I've now got a Power Macintosh G3400 at the moment. And um, I can send low resolution JPEGs of the work to publishers by email for checking instantly on the same day. I can get them back well the next day. I can make the changes, I can make quite large changes if necessary, I can actually move objects from here to there. And um, last December, when the first visual observation was made of uh, an extrasolar planet, Taubotis, um, again I was, I was commissioned to do the impression of what this would look like and all the whole thing was sent around the world by internet. Around the world, a community of space artists has now become established. Some of those artists even have first-hand knowledge of the subject they create images of. The International Association of Astronomical Artists, the IAAA, includes most of the um, best-known space artists, the ones who have been around for quite a while, and um, it even includes at least one astronaut, ex-astronaut, Alan Bean, who's a, an excellent artist and has produced several books of his work. In 1988, I got the opportunity to go to Iceland on, an, on a, a workshop with the International Association of Astronomical Artists and um, this was absolutely a, a revelation. I, I actually for the first time met a dozen artists who were on the, actually on the same wavelength as myself who did the same kind of thing and we were able to talk and exchange tips and talk about our work and everything else. One of the artists on the Iceland workshop was um, actually Alexei Leonov, the, uh, the Russian cosmonaut, who was the first man to walk in space. In 1965, he actually left his spacecraft for about 10 minutes, and he told us how he had great difficulty in getting back into it again as well. He almost thought he was going to run out of oxygen. And um, he's a very fine artist, and um, I met many of the artists who are now considered as friends.
field trips to remote locations are more than just social gatherings of like-minded artists. Workshops of this kind are very useful. We've, we've been to Hawaii, we've been to the um, desert areas of America, Utah, Canyonlands, Archie's National Park. All these places are what we call analogues of other planets. The geology of the landscapes is, is very similar to what you'd find on, for example, Mars. And um, they are a huge help in, in really creating realistic looking paintings. You, you can do a certain amount out of your head, but it, it always helps to be able to actually sit and sketch rocks, mountains, whatever, volcanoes, and to get, really get the feel of it in, into your head. And, and so then this actually really, I think, does help when you come to paint them later. So what would David Hardy's ultimate artistic ambition be? I think virtually every space artist I know is, is a frustrated astronaut. Uh, if you ask any of them the question, would you like to go into space, I don't, I don't think I know one who wouldn't immediately say, yes, please, give me the chance, I'll do it. The nearest I've been able to get to, um, to visiting other worlds is, I suppose, to put myself into my own paintings, which I've done a couple of times. But uh, there's no doubt at all that ultimately, um, I don't suppose I ever shall, but it, my, my aim would really be to, to actually go into space and to, uh, to be able to paint in situ there. <laughs>